everybody. This is Jake Stenzi. I host the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father of six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbaro. Gino, how's it going? Mr. Stenziano. Doing good, bro. How are you? Always making it happen, big man. Before we get this thing kicked off, let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsor. Gino, I know a lot of the listeners are wanting to take their multifamily investing business to the next level. I know you've been hard at work helping Jake and Gino students do just that using our framework. GDAD, explain to the listeners how they can get our help. Guys, we've been hard at work growing our community of like-minded investors, and the results of our members has been nothing short of incredible. We're looking to grow this amazing group of investors. What we're looking for is those that want to follow our proprietary framework we've created. Buy right, manage right, and finance right. Leverage our connections, education, and mentorship as ways to take your business to the next level. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become a part of this amazing community, apply to work with us at jakeandgino.com forward slash apply. Okay, today's guest is Robert Kiyosaki, best known as the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the number one personal finance book of all time. Robert has challenged and changed the way tens of million people around the world think about money. He's an entrepreneur, educator, and investor who believes the world needs more entrepreneurs. With perspectives on money and investing that often contradict conventional wisdom, Robert has earned an international reputation for straight talk, irreverence, and courage, and has become a passionate and outspoken advocate for financial freedom. Robert's most recent books, Why the Rich Are Getting Richer and More Important Than Money, were published in the spring of 2017 to mark the 20th anniversary of the 1997 release of the classic Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So without further ado, Robert, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, you guys. Nice to talk to you. Hey, it's it's a pleasure to have you here. Now, everyone listening to the show, they know they know you, they know your story. They know, you know, how you've created a successful career and reached financial freedom. Why don't you tell them a little bit about what the day-to-day now looks like after you've reached that milestone? Well, I don't know what you mean by that, but uh, I, uh, I speak to guys like you. I teach. <laughs> I write. I run companies. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. And, um, you know, it's just, you know, for a lot of people, I think it's the good life, but it's really tough. You know, I mean, business is not tough. And in many ways, not that it's getting worse, but the environment's getting worse. You know, there was that woman who was just, she just sued and won a $21 million lawsuit because she had to work on Sundays. Now, as an entrepreneur, I never stop working. (laughs) You know what I mean? I have more money than I'll ever, ever need, but I don't stop working. So this person, the way she gets her money is to sue people. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it's, I go, why do I have employees then? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so my big concern is, and I'm a former Marine pilot. I fought in Vietnam twice. And I fought for capitalism. I didn't fight for the socialism, fascism, and communism stuff. I mean, if you want to, it's a free country. You want to be a communist? knock yourself out. You want to be a fascist, run for politics. You know, you want to be a socialist, as Marx says, socialism is the step before communism. And that's kind of my concern as I I look around the world right now. So what do I do all day? I'm kind of wondering, it's kind of like that book Atlas Shrugged that came out in the 50s by Ayn Rand. And what happened, for did not read the book, is the socialists took over the world. And the capitalists went into hiding. And the whole world fell apart because socialists don't know how to run the economy. So they're not bad people. I'm not saying they're bad people. They're just idealistic. You know, they think they can actually tax everybody and everybody gets everything for free. Maybe I'm close-minded to that, but I really don't want anything for free. I'd rather go earn it. It's kind of a fun game. And that's what makes an entrepreneur an entrepreneur. It's kind of fun. Mm-hmm. But too many of our schools today are pumping out socialists, fascists, and communists. And that concerns me. 
Mm-hmm. So Robert, uh, from what I'm hearing is money is not the cause for you. Money is the result because you're an entrepreneur. When you became financially free, what did that feel like to you? You're around 47 years old and you became financially free. What was that feeling? And what did you think your life would end up, would you end up doing after that? Well, it was good. It was a good feeling for about 10 minutes. I got back to work. You know, <laughs> I, it's, it's, for me, it's a game, you know, it, a game is something that there's risk, there's rules, there's sidelines, there's opponents and all that. I like games. And so it, it was a nice feeling it was congratulations, you're financially free. And it wasn't really a big deal. I was making about a 10,000 a month tax free and my expenses were down to 3,000. So it wasn't Donald Trump stuff, mm-hmm. but it was a start. It meant I, I had succeeded even though small. And I had failed many, many times up to that point, which is what most of these communist, socialists, and fascists are telling you don't have to do, just take from the rich and give to the poor. And, you know, most school teachers, my whole family school teachers, and they're nice people, they're good people, they're so-called educated people, but their core culture is take from the rich and give to the poor. And... I don't know about you, but I'd rather hang on to my money. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know. You want to give to the poor? Give your money. Don't take. Don't take mine. That's mm-hmm. how I. Do I agree. Uh, listen, I have six kids. I homeschool my six kids, and right behind me here, they play cash flow. And this is right. the most. This right. is the most important document that they will ever learn when they're 13 years old. It's a balance sheet and income statement. They need to learn financial education. Where would you start kids learning financial education? Because to me, that's the core competency. I start with Dave Ramsey because it's like you need to know what personal debt and business debt is. You need to learn how to put your mind into savings. You need to learn how to not instantly gratify yourself. So that's a low-level financial intelligence that a 12- and a 13-year-old can start learning. But as they get a little bit higher, a little bit more advanced, where do you think they should start diving into? Obviously, your stuff, but like, like even more drill down. Well, Financial statement, income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flow. Those are the three basic uh, problems. They don't teach that at school. I was mm-hmm. I was at a dental hygienist's office yesterday, and she asked me what I did. With my mouth, with her fingers on my mouth. I said, "Well, I teach financial education." She says, "Oh, I'm so lucky. I had that in high school." Mm-hmm. And what, what we can touch is I was taught how to balance the checkbook and save money and open a 401k. And I just kind of bit my tongue because being a former Marine, I, I am not the most polite individual on earth. <laughs> and I, didn't want to, I just want to say, you've been brainwashed. You've been brainwashed. You know what I mean? Don't you know that money isn't money anymore? Money is fake. My, my, my next book coming out in April or May is called Fake. Fake Money, Fake Teachers, and Fake Assets. And again, my books are not written for everybody. You know, most people really don't have what my uh, friends call chutzpah. You know, the Mexicans' friends call it gojones. <laughs> you know, and my rugby friends call it guts. People have it, but they just rather not use it. You know what I mean? They'd rather be, they want to have the rich pay for them. You know, and that's really not my attitude on life. And you're entitled to your attitude and your belief system. But I think what you're doing is perfect, you know. The financial statement is your report card when you leave school. And these new freshmen, congressmen, and all that, you know, that one uh, AOC, Alex Ocasio, she was a bartender. And Maxine Waters, I don't know what she did, but they're now on the finance committee of our government. And you know they want to play Robin Hood. They mm-hmm. all want to play Robin Hood. Mm-hmm. I think I don't want to play that game, you know? So that's why financial education to me is how do you make as much money as possible and pay zero taxes? That's the game. Mm -hmm. That's the game that President Trump and I play. That's where we wrote two books together. Now we can hear all you socialists and communists saying, oh, but somebody's got to pay taxes. Yeah, you pay taxes. (laughs) So I just play a different game. And the reason I like you guys is because you're teaching people to play that same game. Because real estate is really about debt and taxes. There's nothing else but, but that. I can use other people's money. I can make a lot of money. And through the magic of accounting and financial statements, voila, 
there's, there's appreciation, depreciation, and amortization, all tax-free. So that's the hygienist. Oh, yeah, I had financial education. I can balance a checkbook. I go, whoa, Superman. You know, I mean, with that much education, you're dangerous. Oh, yes, I know. I know a lot. I can balance a checkbook. I, go, I don't have a checkbook. You know, I mean, it's, it's just pathetic what's coming out of school today. So, Robert, let me ask you, how does she do your piece? That's, that's why I'm glad you're teaching your kids with a cash flow game. They mm -hmm. can have fun learning without knowing they're learning. And so you're saying that she does not know the name Robert Kiyosaki. She must be really uneducated completely, at least not to know who she's speaking to. I mean, that's, that's mind-boggling to me in the first event. I mean, you're a well-known name. People should at least know that you've written 30 books, at least the very top. For her. So for her to ask you, you know that conversation is going south before it even starts, correct? Well, I, that's what I thought. But no, I, I, I do have a pretty big ego, but you know, I, I, I just felt empathy. You know, it's, he's in student loan debt up to the yin yang. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, you know, we had a thing called the subprime crisis in 2007, right? I mean, everybody mm -hmm. saw that. I mean, you saw me on CNN. I was, I, I called the, I was with Wolf Blitzer and I called the crash of Lehman Brothers. And like everybody could see it, but if you're not educated, you can't see it. Mm -hmm. So that today what we have is a, is a subprime education problem. Mm -hmm. And what we've done since 2007 is we've loaded up these poor students with student loan debt. And today student loan debt is over a trillion dollars. So because our school systems are complicit with the communist republic of the world, they're teaching kids by by keeping them ignorant about money, they're actually, you know, sabotaging their own students. So mm -hmm. that's okay. It's a dilemma. Do you know what I mean? Why don't we teach kids about money? Well, if they did, maybe they wouldn't be so stupid. I mean, she actually thought balancing a checkbook was financial education. At the same time, the next breath, she's talking, complaining about her student loan debt. I said, well, there was subprime mortgages, and now we have subprime education. And that's my concern. You know, I'm just saying our schools are teaching people to be fascists, socialists, and communists, good people. But they have no idea what they're talking about. They'd be like, they'd be like you know, asking me about childbirth. I have no idea what childbirth is like. You know, I don't even have kids. But don't ask me about childbirth because I don't think about it. But these guys are all experts on money. Mm -hmm. I do. I do. In your book uh, that you're coming out fake, what do you want people and readers to get from the book? What's the general premise of the big ideas coming out of that book? Well, it's, it's uh, basically rich dad, poor dad on steroids because in rich dad, poor dad, I had to dumb it down. You know what I mean? I had to make it real dumb. That's why it's so popular. <laughs> mm -hmm. A lot of pictures, and a, lot of simple word, a little conversation between, my rich dad and my poor dad and all that stuff. Everybody could understand it. But in fake, I went into what is the actual art and science behind fake money. That our money stopped being money in 1971. That's why number, rule number one in rich dad, poor dad is rich don't work for money. The other thing is in rich dad, poor dad is taxes and corporations, how you protect your assets and things like this. The average person doesn't even get that one. So the next part of fake, so fake is fake money, and everybody's working for fake money. You know, the U.S. dollar has lost 95% of its value in the last 40 years. Only got 5%. It's not going to take long. Anyway, mm -hmm. so fake, fake, fake money, then fake teachers, is most school teachers know nothing about money. Why would you listen to them? Why would you take financial advice or political advice from somebody who's broke all the time. So my poor dad was a PhD from Stanford, Northwestern, University of Chicago. PhD stands for poor, helpless, and desperate. You know, and they're, and they're teaching kids about life. I'm going, hey, what are you doing? So you have fake teachers. And the worst fake teachers are accounting teachers. You know, I remember I was in the MBA program. That's when I dropped out of the MBA program because I knew more about accounting than my accounting teacher. Mm -hmm. and the third part is fake assets. You know, as I say in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, assets put money in your pocket. These stocks, bonds, mutual funds, 
They take money from your pocket. Wake up and smell the coffee, sports fans. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not designed to make you rich. They're designed to make the banks rich, Wall Street rich. But they're, oh, I have a 401k. I have a Roth IRA. I go, whoa, Tarzan. Whoa, man, I tell you, you're really going for it, aren't you? <laughs> but the money is coming out of your pocket, Tarzan or Tarzana, whatever you are. You know, and the love, thing I love about real estate, I use other people's money. It puts money in my pocket, my multifamily homes, and I pay no taxes. You know, that's a real asset. Not this mutual fund, ETF, savings. You know, if you want to do that, that's up to you. So fake is for the one percenters. And it won't be popular in the academic world because I trash the teachers up one side <laughs> and down the other. <laughs> so, uh, education, don't get me wrong, education is important, but not that garbage they teach you in school. What you're doing with your kids, teaching them cash flow, understanding income statements, balance sheets, statements of cash flow, your kids are far ahead of those Harvard graduates. I have to tell Jake this story. We bought our property two weeks ago, Jake. I had my son invest 5,000 bucks, his own money into it, took the money out of, the, out of his bank account. And he comes and goes to me, he says, dad, can I borrow money from you to invest in the deal? I'm like, he's getting it. He's actually asking to borrow money. I'm like, nope, you can't borrow money from me because this deal is already done. But maybe the next one you can. So I've got the wheels spinning already. So he's already using dad's money, which I was like, oh, that's, that's 50, music's 50. my ears. Correct. You know, the reason, the reason the rich get richer is they use fake money, <laughs> other people's money. You know, mm -hmm. Why would you say? So, and look, there's different types of financial education for different types of people. Do you know what I mean? If, yes. if you're a person who is risk averse, you think that having a PhD is your salvation of life and a 401k and buying a house, then rich dad education is not for you, obviously. You know, but if, if you like the games, I love the game. I love real estate. I love entrepreneurship. I, I, I love understanding taxes. I, know, I love understanding the financial systems. I'm a student of it. The more I studied it, the, the, that's why lesson number one in Rich Dad Poor Dad is the rich don't work for money because it's fake. And our teachers are fake. And our assets are fake. Look at that stock market, man. I mean, people are taking a pounding right now. Mm -hmm. That's kind of why I write. And if, if, if you kind of like what's happening, then don't. Big fake. So you're an educator. How do you get people to make that paradigm shift, that, that mind shift from saying, okay, everything I'm hearing is right. What's the next steps that I need to take? Because I know a lot of people out there are struggling, but they don't know what to do next. What's the next thing? Start reading Kiyosaki, start going on. What, what, should, they, what should they do? Well, I think that's, you know, I'm, I'm working on a project this week, and I think the no, number one thing is change is change. Okay. We mm -hmm. all know change it's changing so fast right now the problem is people cannot change that's the problem mm -hmm. change is changing, but people aren't changing so, the, so you have to take a look at why aren't people changing well number one they went to school and they were taught don't make mistakes then they told you you know they then they told you don't cheat and don't cheat means you know you, you can't ask for help i was very cooperative at test time in school I was sat next to the smartest girl and she always gave me the answers, you know. <laughs> I do the same thing today. I have the smartest accountants, smartest attorneys, same as Trump. Now, I'm not saying he's a great guy. I mean, I like the guy, but a lot of people hate him and I understand why they hate him. But none of, look at what the rich do. The rich have great bookkeepers, great accountants, great attorneys, great bankers, you know. They're, 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 they play the game differently than the academics. So that's why I wrote fake, you know, fake money, fake teachers, fake assets. Most people are working for money and it's depreciating at a high rate of speed because they print it. Second is they, they listen to fake teachers. They're called stock brokers, real estate brokers, insurance brokers. And I always say the reason they're called brokers because they're broker than you are. Like, <laughs> they gotta sell you something. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the third is a fake asset. You know, assets put money in your pocket. And these guys, Wall Street's just sucking cash out of their pocket. They're the OPM. You're the, you know, if you have a 401k, you're the OPM. That's right. You know, I mean, I mean, God, oh my. now, let me caveat that. For 95% of the people, that's the best advice you can get. 
be stupid. Just let them suck the cash out of your pocket. Or you can go to your classes, you know, you have a, you have a multifamily class, you know, real estate's a big subject. But real estate is really about debt and taxes. That's what it's about. I want to use other people's money. I don't want to pay taxes. I want to make a lot of money. Legal. What, what asset classes are you investing in right now? What do you see going forward in the future? Because I know you used to be big in gas and oil and commodities. What, what do you like going, going forward? I've always loved, uh, fake is really about gold and silver, real money. There's mm -hmm. three types of money today. It's God's money, which is gold and silver. Gold, gold I think, is 40, number 40, 479 or 47. Anyway, gold and silver are God's money. They were here. Gold and silver was here before we were here. Gold and silver were here when the earth was formed. It'll be here when we're all gone. Then you have uh, fiat, you know, government money, which is called the U.S. dollar, the peso, the yen, the euro. And then you have people's money, which is Bitcoin. Uh, we call that blockchain and all that stuff. So you have more choices on money today, you know. So, but the average person is stuck in government money, central bank money, you know, the Fed. And they, they just print it. <laughs> They're printing it or they destroy it, you know, either way. Mm -hmm. And so the reason that we're in big trouble today is, you know, as you know, I think they print $26 billion or something. And the Fed is now destroying that money. So it's it's pretty dangerous time. So I'd rather have gold. I've, I've always, since I don't need money, since I use debt, I don't pay taxes legally. I just save gold and silver. Mm -hmm. offshore legally I don't want anything inside this country and then as far as hard assets you're in multifamily uh, gas oil and anything else yeah golf courses hotels so simple stuff you know commercial um, it's not rocket science mm -hmm. <laughs> and I have a, I, but the thing is you know, people who listen right now well I don't know I don't have any money well, you're not supposed to use your money. <laughs> Classic example started out zero, basically zero dollars and uh, turned it around pretty quick, right, Gina? Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, where do you see, uh, you know, you said the 1%, you're looking for that fake, that 1%. How do you spread your message? I mean, like you said, people need to change. I'm trying to get the people to change. I'm trying to get them to change your mindset. How do you do that I, as an educator? That, that's what my big question is. And I'm having struggles with that. When I, when I resonate with the right people, it clicks. Those other people that think they want to change, how do, you, how do you try to convince them? How do you get them over the hump? Well, the reason I created the cash flow game is because you have to do something. You know, who said it? Mark Twain said the best, way to, the best way to get ahead is get started. And so the cash flow game is that's how I learned. I played Monopoly for years. You know, Monopoly is not a tough game. It's four greenhouses, 1031 Red Hotel. But I was playing that game every day with my rich dad. That's how he taught me about investing. So I, my wife and I, Kim, created the cash flow game so you could learn accounting also. Income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flow. They never teach you that in school. And that poor, I felt for her, that dental hygienist, you know, said, oh, I can balance a checkbook. Well, that's your expense. That's the expense side, income expense. That's all you're doing. But she thinks she's educated. She has, she has her, you know, a bachelor's degree in teeth or something. And I'm glad she did it because I like to have my teeth clean. But that poor woman, you know, and, she's, and she's got three kids, she's single, and she is toast right now. Mm -hmm. she thinks she's educated. And she thinks she's doing the right because she has a job. But taxes are going to kill her. You know, this, track, this Trump tax cut didn't help the poor and middle class. It helped the rich. You know, oh, it's a bonus depreciation, money. baby. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it was for corporate taxes, not employee taxes. So anyway, it's just how do you get people to change? I don't know. I don't think it's possible. You got to read Atlas Shrugs. That's what I did. Blew my well, hair back. No, I must say the person has got to want to change. Yep. Most people don't want to, most people dream of getting rich, right? They dream of it, but they don't do anything about it. They dream mm -hmm. about it. You know, like mm -hmm. When I was a kid, I used to dream of going out with a Playboy bunny, but I never did. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean, what was nice dream, you know what I mean? <laughs> but anyway, we all have dreams, but mm -hmm. most people just dream. 
you know, they, they spend their time on Facebook and all that other stuff and social media. It's a waste of my time. I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, time is most, my most valuable asset. So that's why mm -hmm. playing cash flow, going to your classes, studying with you guys is the very important thing to do. What do you see the biggest mistake that investors make? If you had to choose one mistake that you made an investor, what's the biggest one that you've made? I don't have a bookkeeper. Yeah. That's simple, huh? Really, that's simple. You gotta have a bookkeeper. Uh huh. Because most people don't have accurate records. If you don't have accurate rec records, you don't know where you are. And I, I meet, I meet these yo-yos. I mean, I meet them every single day. I mean, I, I just go nuts. Oh, uh, I have a bookkeeper. My husband does our books. Oh, my wife does my books. I go, are you nuts? Typical small business. Hear it all the time. Mom and yeah. pops. Mom and pop. And the problem with that is money is one of the most emotional subjects there is. You know, sex, money, politics, religion. Right? Mm -hmm. So you can't look at your numbers. And if you're trying to hide your numbers, it's like, you know, Carlos Ghosn, he was trying to hide, hide his numbers and now in jail. You know, if you don't know where you're at with your numbers, you're toast. And I'm not, you know, I was a, I flunked out of school so many times. I'm not smart at all, but I hire smart people. I hire smart accountants, smart bookkeepers, smart attorneys, and it's a team sport. You know, but most people go to school if they're A students, oh, I have to know everything. And then they try and do their own books. They try and look at their own properties. I don't, I don't do that stuff. I got other things. Mm -hmm. But the average person who went to school is in trouble because they actually learned some very poor habits, you know, the habits that keep you poor. They may have a high paying job, but you're paying high taxes. I want to, I want to use other people's money and I want to pay no taxes and I want to make a lot of money and I want a lot of free time. You know, the rich don't work for money. Real number one and rich dad, poor dad. Before we get to the short answer question, you've built this massive business, massive empire. How have you been able to build up and build your systems? I mean, and build your team because you talk about hiring great and hiring great. How do you choose great people and how have you been able to scale your, your business? So tell you, so how do you find a good wife? How do you find a good husband? Just a lot of frogs, you know? <laughs> you got to get those reps in. <laughs> Robert, I, I really appreciate everything you're saying because uh, I, I know you don't uh, know Gino and my story too well, but uh, you know, early on, I read your book. I read Atlas Shrugged, and since then, we've actually created three companies, Rand Partners, Rand Capital, and Rand Property Management, and it's all been based on that objectivist philosophy, and uh, so I really appreciate you bringing that up because we don't bring it up a whole lot on, on the show, but you know, there, there's so many important learnings that have come out of that book, so I appreciate you bringing that up early on. It's, a, it's, it's really something that's changed my life. You know, the most important thing is you're doing something. Yeah. Your theory. And most of these guys I talk to, they're theory guys. You know, they're not real. They're, they're fake as they come. They're fake as they come. Man. So at least you're, have you, miss, have you made some mistakes? We've made a ton of mistakes. <laughs> yes. That's, that's and every time we, we analyze those mistakes and we learn from it, it makes us that much stronger. It's important. And a teacher will punish you for making your mistakes. That's mm -hmm. why my poor dad, PhD stands for poor helpless and desperate. He made no mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's Later a write that down. That's a college professor. They're good people. Don't get me wrong. But I wouldn't trust them with my money. Nope. You'd hire no. them as employees, maybe. Well, you, you look at who we put out lately. We had Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. I mean, those guys were Rhodes Scholars and all this stuff. But they know how to steal money. They don't know how to... <laughs> Reach in your pocket every step of the way. I don't know why. I don't know why Trump didn't go after the Clinton Foundation. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's probably something behind the scenes that we don't know about, right? <laughs> but that's most nonprofits. You know, most nonprofits are just licenses to steal money. Yeah. You know, for example, you know, this World Wildlife Fund. That money doesn't go to wildlife. It goes to salaries and paychecks. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's, it's a bunch of BS. It's funny you mention. It's funny you mentioned the nonprofit. I've got my wife on board now too because we have friends who want to start a nonprofit uh, as far as like in marriage counseling. So the first thing she said to me is, "Why are they going to do a nonprofit? 
And I'm like, yeah. I got my wife brainwashed because right. she's like, it's for profit. And I said, yeah, well, you want to give back services and all. I said, it's really not nonprofit because you've got to pay salaries. You've got to pay expenses, living expenses and all. So she's yeah. totally on board now, totally bought into the whole premise also. She gets well, it. you start on nonprofits because they're tax exempt. Mm -hmm. Yes. Nonprofit. They're, they're ways to shelter cash. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a way not to pay taxes. If people could wake up and smell the, Starbucks, you know, they go, oh my goodness. <laughs> mm -hmm. I agree. You know, I, I just think it's kind of interesting with all this. Like I said, I, I fought in Vietnam twice and I fought for capitalism. I didn't fight for socialism, communism, fascism. And what are we are today? We're a socialist, fascist, going to communist. You know, we, the government's going to take care of everybody. Well, that's not the country I fought for. Mm -hmm. That's not the philosophy I fought for. And the worst thing about it, too, is I came back, I'm still kind of PO'd about it. I get spit on, you know, by the same guys that are running California right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm going, why did I fight for you? You know, why? I don't know that you did. They just, they just were a, a benefactor of what you were doing. So, well, I, as I, I, got, I got hammered for this one, you know, being a Marine with a big mouth like Trump. They asked me, they said, well, what did you learn? I said, I said, I want to kill communists. I should have just stayed home and gone to city. Hall. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, there wasn't social media in those days. <laughs> See, that, the problem is a person doesn't know they're a communist. They don't know they're a fascist. A fascist is somebody who wants to tell you how to run your life. Like everybody should wear blue, blue shirts today. That's just their status, their fascist. Mm -hmm. And a socialist, you know, they, they want to take your money and give it to everybody else. Well, that's fine, but why not just they don't have any money themselves. You know, so it's it's they just don't know. It's, it's financial ignorance, it's, it's philosophical ignorance. Oh, well the problem the problem, Robert, is that you surround yourself with who you're gonna become, right? So when I was in the restaurant, I was surrounding myself with guys who were making 15 bucks an hour. I start Jake and Gino. I surround myself with people like Robert Kiyosaki, Jay Abraham, T. Harbecker, and I elevate my my status and my ability to surround myself with smarter people, and I learn from them. So all the socialists huddle together. They're not radically open-minded, and they just live in their own bubble, and they, you know, they're by themselves, and that's what they think. So if they step out of there and actually look and start surrounding themselves with different people, maybe they can change. But they're it's not at that point in their lives. Too. It's driven by emotion. Yeah. yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's their, their thoughts, you know, thought has a structure to it. And their thought structure is, you know, not capitalist. Mm -hmm. and, and you're entitled to your thoughts, but my concern is our whole country is going that way right now. We're not too far away. You know, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty frightening right now. Could you, imagine if, could you imagine if Trump didn't get elected? I mean, he at least slowed the train down a little bit. If he had not gotten elected, it would have been off the cliff by the end of the uh, another four years. It really would have turned a lot. He can only slow it down so much as far as business regulations, as far as cutting some taxes, as far as doing some of that. But it would have been precipitated a lot quicker, I think, if he had not won that election. Yeah, I agree. But the problem is I, I don't think anybody can stop what's going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. We're going off. The U.S. is going off the cliff because of, the central bank system. So that's why I write and I speak and I go and say, look, you better start protecting yourself now. You know, so that's why I write and I speak. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I have gold and silver because gold and silver will be here when the dollar is gone. And I don't know how much longer the U.S. dollar will survive. Mm -hmm. It's as pessimistic as I get, probably a 10% chance of it not surviving. But no fiat currency has ever survived, never. Mm -hmm. Not if, it's just when. So all these guys saving money and then these CEOs taking borrowed money and pumping up their stock price, that's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. Then we have subprime education and student loans. My God, what have we done? So that's, the, that's the next one that's going to that's gonna kick it over the edge is the, uh, is the student debt, right? Mm -hmm. well, it, 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 we screw our students. Our own school teachers and our own academic guys they got paid exorbitant salaries. Don't don't let them kid you. Yeah, ripping off the students. As far as I'm, so, that, so that's and, and they don't learn anything about money. <laughs> Ridiculous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Education is important. Get me wrong, but what are you learning? Who's teaching? So that's what my book fakes about. It's a little more in depth into my um, 
kind of frustration with or my sadness talking to that dental hygienist who thinks she's educated. She has a bachelor's degree and she took out of balance a checkbook and she has a 401k. I guess it's better than nothing, but it's all fake. No, at least she's working. <laughs> yeah. At least she cleaned my teeth. She's pretty good at it. <laughs> Full claim this morning. Uh-huh. That's important. That's important. Robert, I, w- I want to know what is your best habit for success? We've had some great guys on the show and I selfishly asked this because I want to, I want to learn from everyone that comes on. Is there something you do on a daily or weekly basis that's, uh, that's led to your success? Yeah, I've always been into personal development. You know, um, years ago I took a thing called EST, EST, it's called, it's called Landmark today and all mm-hmm. this. I study metaphysics. Every morning I meditate. Uh, I read spiritual books as well as financial books. Um, my friend and I, we all, my, my friends all played rugby. We're those, those macho guys that are the Gillette's commercials are against. Ah, oh, dude, did you he see needs, that commercial? He needs, he needs the insurance, Gino, you know, the EPLI and the E and all this stuff I filled out yesterday. He's a cover his butt, right? <laughs> uh-huh. mm-hmm. So my, so my, my rugby fire play, where we went to a meditation class, there was like 30 people, you know, 28 were women, two or two rugby players in there. So we meditate. So there's a, there's an evolution. I, I sense that men have to go through also that, that, and the women are coming on this hashtag me too. Well, I don't say they're great with that because as we know, sexual harassment goes both ways. Can't say that publicly, but it goes both ways. Not in the courts. But the women's movement is big, 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 and they're going to take over, which is a good thing. There's all some bad things too. So anyway, it's all changing. And so I think the number one thing for anybody, male or female, white, black, or purple, is how fast can you change? Because change is changing. Change is changing. And if you're not changing, you're being left behind. Mm -hmm. That's why it's meditation, metaphysical books, like, Eckhart Tolle, you know, uh, The Power of Now, The New Earth. A lot of great books out there on the spirituality of change. Mm-hmm. It's a change of consciousness, a change of awareness. It's not a right and a wrong stuff, you know. Look mm-hmm. at religion. I'm, not, I'm not very religious, and I support people who are religious. But there's been more, war, more wars in the name of God. You know, what the hell happened to us? There's stuff going on in Syria and Iraq and the Middle East. It's about it, they say it's about God, but it's not. It's about ego, just ego, 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 probably male ego. Mm-hmm. So I talked to my male friends and I said, look, you better change because women are changing. Change is changing. Let's remember that. How fast are you changing? You know, if you actually believe in job security, you're obsolete, man. You're as obsolete as they come. You know, for just, you know, there's going to be driverless trucks and driverless cars and all these guys driving for Uber right now. You know, it's toast. So real estate is still the best, in my opinion, of all the asset classes. It's still the best because people will always need a roof over their head and a toilet. You know what I mean? You gotta have those cool things you're set, man. Mm-hmm. You know, but you don't have those things, life's pretty painful. You, know? <laughs> you can't get an apartment on Amazon yet. <laughs> Not yet. You can sit outside the door. You know? That's right. Uh, we touched a lot on education. This is the last question I have for you today. Is there a, you mentioned there was, a, I think, a meditation book you just threw out there. Is, a, is there a book recommendation that uh, has impacted you in the last few years that you want to recommend to the listeners? Yeah, there's a really simple book. It was called Miracle Morning by mm-hmm. Hal Elrod, E-L-R-O-D. It's a good start, especially for, you know, I'm a former Marine and a rugby player. And, you know, I like chasing women. I used to. <laughs> not that I know. <laughs> And that kind of behavior today is not tolerated. Yeah. You know what I mean? We know. So I, hang out, I hang out with my, ex, my ex-pilot friends and my ex-rugby player friends. And we speak in whispers now. Whereas before, <laughs> before it was common to speak out loud, you know. So Hal Elrod is called Miracle Morning. His name is E-L-R-O-D. It's a good start, especially for guys to get in touch with the, um, not your more feminine side, but how to change faster. Change is changing. Everything is changing, but humans aren't changing fast enough. And that's what I say to so many people. You know, like, like I have these guys, well, I've got a safe, secure job. And I said, well, how long? Do you know what I mean? Like I said, that woman sued, got $21 million. 
for being forced to work on Sundays. All that does is it causes a guy like me not to want employees. You know, she got rich, but I'm going to figure out ways not to have employees. Mm -hmm. and, and they say that, you know, like 60% of the workforce won't have jobs pretty soon. There'll be independent contractors, self-employed people. Then you have to have your own retirement, your own medical, you know, your own taxes and all this stuff. So our schools are so obsolete, but it's because we cannot change with change. Change is changing. How fast can you change today? And so that's why it's Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod, very simple book. But I just follow his three or four steps. and I've done it probably five out of seven days. It's really made a big difference in how we, I look uh, at the world. We, I still have problems. Don't get me wrong. I still have problems. No doubt. Yeah, we've had Hal on the show. We like him. We're big fans. So he's, he's a good guy. Um, appreciate how, how you keep it real. I definitely am going to get a copy of your, of your book. Um, the name of the book again is Fake. And it's coming out? Probably April. April. And uh, it's going to be everywhere, I'm assuming. You're going to be able to get it at Barnes & Noble and, and everywhere. Yeah. Richdad.com, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm heading up to New York in April to do the uh, dog and pony show. Excellent. Excellent. We'll, we'll be sure to uh, pick that one up. Uh, Gino, anything else uh, for the Rich Dad? Action steps for everybody listening. First thing, if you've never read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, pick up the book tomorrow. Start reading it because your house is not an asset. If my 15-year-old can say money, an asset is puts money in your pocket and a liability takes money out of your pocket. If you don't know that, you need to buy the book. Second thing is buy the rest of Robert's books. I don't know if you can see behind me, but I've got about 30 of his books. He's got a great team. You need to learn about how to hire people, how to get rid of the menial jobs, and don't worry about paying. Third thing is start having that paradigm shift about money. Money is not real. Like he said, 1971, that's when money became fake. Third thing is don't work for money. Work for equity. Transactions do not make you rich. Equity makes you rich. Transactions pay the bill. I can keep going on and on, but I think those are the highlights that I take from 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 uh, the podcast today and also take responsibility of your life. Robert's been talking about it the whole time. He hasn't used that word, but if Pete, you're responsible for your life and you're educated, you're going to have a great successful life because when something goes wrong, you're not blaming somebody else. You're going to take responsibility and learn from it like we had. We had our first live event two years ago was 175 people. The one this year was 400. The one next year is going to be seven to 800. It's learning making mistakes, learning. I could have blamed Jake for, you know what, we should have sold more tickets, but no, we figured it out, we learned. So take responsibility and you'll love your life. Anything else, Mr. Stenziano? No, that's it. Get, get your Atlas Shrug and, uh, and I'm, I think uh, Robert's spot on with this stuff. So I really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Robert. Congratulations for young guys. Keep going. We'll Keep do it. We will. It. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, Robert. You. Thank you, guys. Thank you.